שבכל הלילות עד אוכלים בצומת On this night throughout the world, millions of Jewish people sit down together around the table and ask the question, why is this night different from all other nights? It is on this night when a feast, a meal of freedom is shared, commemorating an event that took place 3,500 years earlier. It is on this night that the Passover is celebrated. The holiday of Passover recalls the liberation of the children of Israel from 400 grueling years of Egyptian bondage. The Exodus when Moses led more than 600,000 Hebrew slaves with their meager possessions out from a land of idolatry into the wilderness of Sinai. In Jerusalem, 1,500 years after the Exodus, Jesus, too, celebrated the Passover. For Jesus, this occasion was no ordinary affair. He had greatly desired to partake of this meal with his disciples. The drama that took place the night of the Passover while sharing the bread and wine was a crucial turning point in world history. Jesus spoke that night in metaphors using symbols which were later to become the hallmark of the Christian faith. Portrayed on countless paintings and other art forms throughout the world, this unique Passover meal has become better known as the Last Supper. The story of the Last Supper takes place in the springtime of the year 30 in the first century, a time when the Holy Land thaws from the cold gray of winter, when riverbeds flow once again with the rains of the wintry season, restoring life to the land, a time when the flora burst forth in spectacular fashion, announcing nature's renaissance. In the air, birds too are a testimony that spring has indeed arrived, returning once again to build their nests. Deer can be seen everywhere, proudly showing off the new arrivals to their families. All of creation is moving in perfect harmony, displaying signs of renewal like the blossoms of the almond tree, announcing a true celebration. The Jewish people also have their rites of spring, the Passover. One month before the feast, Preparations are being made throughout the land. The collecting of the necessary supplies, the selecting from the finest of their herds for the Passover sacrifice, organizing themselves for the long journey up to Jerusalem. Passover is one of three Jewish holidays during the calendar year, which commands a Jewish person to make a pilgrimage to the holy city 
hundreds of thousands go up to Jerusalem to join their extended families and celebrate the Exodus together. During the Passover in the year 30 CE, Provincial Jerusalem was transformed into an international city of different languages and dialects. Its population increased tenfold to over 350,000 for the eight-day affair. The added presence strained municipal resources and services. Limited housing already stretched to its limits forced the pilgrims to sleep in tents or find homeowners willing to extend hospitality. The walls of Jerusalem barely contained the influx of so many visitors. The added stress within the dimensions of the city created a potential for subversion within occupied Judea. The Roman authorities increased their presence, adding more security and tension to a potential powder keg. The regular garrison at the Antonia Fortress overlooking the city was supplemented with troops mainly from the Roman capital in Caesarea. Like many other pilgrims, Jesus and his disciples also made their way to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. The journey on foot from Galilee took five to six days. They traveled familiar terrain down through the warmth of the Jordan Valley, staying overnight at villages or camping in olive groves under the starry skies. In faith, they took little with them, trusting that divine providence would accommodate their every need. As they traveled, more and more people were drawn to hear and follow the teachings of Jesus. He spoke words of love and faith, appealing to the people of the land. Attracted by his concepts of compassion and hope, the crowds grew larger. It was in this little town of Bethany, five miles outside Jerusalem, that Jesus performed his greatest miracle by raising Lazarus from the dead. When he rode a colt down from the Mount of Olives into the city, he was greeted as a king. A large crowd who had come to the feast went out to meet the man of whom so much had been spoken, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The euphoria experienced during their welcome to the holy city gave the disciples the impression that a joyful Passover was ahead of them. But in the days that followed, the disciples were to become witnesses to a new stage in their master's life. The dividing wall had now gone up between Jesus and the religious establishment. The high priest, Caiaphas, was facing a serious dilemma. Jesus had raised much commotion and Caiaphas knew that any more disorder would give Rome the excuse it needed to put an end to religious freedom in Judea. For Caiaphas, Jesus had literally become a wanted fugitive.
The disciples had followed Jesus' every move for the past three years. At times, they had seen Jesus relaxing, praising God for all that he had done. At other times, they had witnessed his distress, saddened by the realities of the times. Thursday morning, only hours before the start of the Passover. Across the Kidron Valley, outside from the hustle and bustle of the city, Jesus prophesied of the things to come. The disciples listened to his every word as he spoke about the future of Jerusalem and the end of the age. On the Mount of Olives, they walked down to the Garden of Gethsemane, a place favored by Jesus. The word Gethsemane is derived from the Hebrew word gachmonim, which means oil press. Gethsemane was known for the purity of the rich olive oil it produced. They needed to make arrangements for the evening's Passover meal. Much had to be done and time was running short. They had not even discussed where they were going to partake of the Seder meal. They waited for Jesus to provide the answers. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room Prepare it there. It was now the 14th day in the month of Nisan, the same exact day 1,500 years earlier on which God brought the Israelites out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. God's indignation toward the Egyptians was unyielding. He saw the bitter oppression that the taskmasters forced on the children of Israel. He heard the wailing from Israelite mothers as the Egyptians drowned their baby boys in the Nile River. He sent Moses to demand of Pharaoh to release his people, but Pharaoh refused, claiming that I know not the Lord. The hand of God was swift as he devastated Egypt with ten different plagues, locusts, hail, Frogs and darkness engulfed the land. God had given warning ten times to Pharaoh to heed his voice. Pharaoh had refused. The river Nile, 
Egypt's lifeline, provided for Egypt's very existence. 95% of the population was heavily concentrated along its banks. The first plague turned this river to blood. Reference to the blood would be alluded to again. It was with the tenth and most horrible plague that the blood of the lamb would be used to save the children of Israel from the angel of death. blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live and when I see the blood I will pass over you and no plague will befall you God's deliverance of the Israelites was the greatest turning point in the history of the Jewish people. The Exodus marked not only the passage from slavery to freedom, but also the emergence of the nation of Israel and the foundation of the covenant between God and his people. After 40 years of wandering in the Sinai, the children of Israel became heir to the Promised Land, a time when 12 nomadic tribes spread throughout the countryside learned to become farmers and work the soil. With the sweat of their brow, they would cultivate the fertile hills and valleys. The desert would bloom as the fields would yield a bounty of produce in return for their toil. Peter and John descended the Mount of Olives, making their way toward the holy city. Despite the early hour of the morning, the sounds that rang out from the city reflected the activity of people engaged in the final Passover preparations. Shortly after entering the city, they found the man they were searching for. The water he collected was probably used for the traditional unleavened bread, matzot. Adding water from a pure source when mixing the dough was considered a religious deed in the handsomest of ways. After realizing that the master had sent the two disciples to look for him, the invitation was extended. He escorted Peter and John to the house where the upper room was located, fulfilling what Jesus had told him. In the ritual of the Passover, leaven was strictly forbidden. Everything of leaven, food made with yeast, had to be removed and burned. A thorough search needed to be performed in storage areas, rugs, garments, or any place that the smallest crumb might have been concealed. Everyone would be engaged in the cleaning process. 
Leaven, according to rabbinical sources, represents sin, that which prevents us from doing the will of God. Peter and John followed their host to the house. It was customary to extend hospitality to strangers in Jerusalem during the Passover period. The extra burden of preparing the Passover feast for Jesus and the Twelve was a weighty assignment. But the hosting family most probably felt honored to have Jesus and his disciples within their home. It was the noon hour, and gathering outside the walls of the holy temple were herds of sheep and goats. Throughout Jerusalem, special earthen ovens were being prepared in the backyards for the roasting of the paschal sacrifices. A thin veil of smoke enveloped the streets and neighborhoods, adding to the holiday atmosphere. Provide the special flour needed to make matzot. Selected grain fields were set aside. This tradition can be traced back to the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. Their hurried departure did not give time enough for the dough to rise. And so unleavened bread is eaten during the Passover. This is how the ancient way of making unleavened bread may have looked. After mixing the flour and water together and kneading the dough several times, it was rolled out flat and quickly placed on a hot surface. Moments later, the dough was turned on its other side. Within minutes, it was ready to eat. Much had to be done, and time was running short. The rabbis in Jesus' time decreed that every Jewish person must participate in the feast. Those who could afford to donated money, fruits, vegetables, and grains. Thirty days prior to Passover, all of the necessary foodstuffs for the meal had been collected and stored for the poor. Today in Israel, as in Jesus' day, Passover is a time when everyone is caught up in the fervor of holiday preparations. This meal, also known as the Seder, which is the Hebrew word for order, is considered a meal fit for a king. 
Farmers bring their first harvest into the markets and kitchens are working at their full capacity. Cooking for the additional 13 guests, with just a few hours left, must have been a real challenge. Today, we wouldn't think twice about common table salt. However, in the time that Jesus lived, salt was a rare and precious commodity said to be literally worth its weight in gold. Fortunately, the Dead Sea was close by, providing affordable salt that was to make the Jerusalem cuisine known for its superior taste. Since no bread was permitted, rice became a major part of the diet during the eight days of Passover. Rice was introduced to the area during the Second Temple period by Alexander the Great. The grain was cultivated in the fertile Hula Valley in the northern part of the Galilee. The right mixture of rainfall and the area's rich soil provided the region with a strong source of income. The Bible mentions the grapevine 16 times, perhaps highlighting the importance of its fruit. The leaves can also be eaten. In fact, one of the most ancient Middle Eastern dishes is stuffed grape leaves. Rabbinical commentary describes Jerusalem cuisine as one that made use of a large variety of spices, especially when cooking vegetables. The spices are referred to as food improvers causing even the simplest of dishes to taste good. The Judean hillside, a desolate mountainous region standing some 3,000 feet above sea level, was transformed into a viable agricultural area. This is reflected in names like the Mount of Olives or Bethlehem, which means house of bread. When the Israelites began to cultivate the land, they were blessed with a bountiful display of native agricultural products. One of the Israelites' greatest innovations was terracing. Retaining walls held onto the precious rainwater for agricultural purposes. In them, vegetation flourished. Spices such as mint, rosemary, and mustard all benefited from this painstaking labor. Terracing prevented soil erosion and added beauty to the countryside. Some of the plants that made their way into the kitchens were not only used as flavorings, but also had medicinal and religious applications. Every detail was essential in order to make each part of the meal appealing to both eye and palate. 
figs and dates, two of the most important fruits of the country, were commonly used for dessert. The women utilized the best of their culinary gifts. They also took pride in their work. The dried fruits were carefully sliced open and stuffed with a variety of nuts and marzipan. An array of tasty food with main courses and side dishes, mixed beans, cooked olives, stuffed vegetables, rice and lentils were just part of the menu. Ceremonial plates too, like the charoset, made from a mixture of nuts, raisins and apples, were prepared. By the early afternoon, the table would be set for the Passover awaiting Jesus and his disciples. This is Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, a legendary city that has a strong hold over our imaginations. This is a place where emotion and history intertwine. Some 2,000 years ago, on this site, at the heart of the city, King Herod rebuilt the Great Temple, a massive building project covering an area of more than 26 acres. It was considered a feat of monumental proportions. Today, all that remains of its magnificence are the stones of the outer western wall. It is Judaism's holiest site, a place of pilgrimage and worship, of joy and lamentation. Its melody echoes across the ages. The sad memory of its destruction has been engraved in the hearts and minds of the Jewish people. Traditional signs of mourning are evident, such as leaving an unpainted spot next to a window or on a wall outside the house, and in daily prayers asking God to rebuild the temple. The Orthodox tie a black thread to their clothes in remembrance of its tragic loss. Even in weddings, an oath is taken. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. Since the last century, the character of Jerusalem has taken a dramatic change. A great influx of Jewish people started arriving from the four corners of the earth, bringing with them their distinctive habits, languages, and traditions. Jerusalem is home to the three great monotheistic religions. Judaism, for whom the centrality of the holy city is paramount. Muslims worship at the Dome of the Rock, from which Muhammad is said to have ascended to heaven. Christians revere this city in which Jesus was crucified. Outside of Jerusalem's eastern wall, the animal market still exists. As in the days of Jesus, it plays an important social role.
It is a place of vibrant commerce, of haggling and bargaining. It is where the attributes of the animals are scrutinized for any imperfections. In the same manner, Peter and John would have purchased their paschal lamb. Trade would have been brisk during the last day of preparation for the Passover. In adherence to the principles of Moses, only a year old lamb without blemish would fit. As the demand would have exceeded the supply available, the price for the animal may have been higher than usual. Within three days, more than 30,000 lamb were to be sold. After purchasing their lamb, the two disciples made their way through the crowded streets and headed toward the temple to offer up the paschal sacrifice before God. We can picture what this sacrifice must have been like by observing the Passover rituals on Mount Gerizim, which are now performed by the Samaritans in Israel. For 2,500 years, the Samaritans have continued the traditions written in the five books of Moses. Here, the ancient ritual of blood sacrifice declaring that all life belongs to God is carried out to this day. More than 60 sheep will be slaughtered before the day is over. The animals are first skinned, and then the hearts and lungs are removed and cooked separately. Fires have been prepared in ovens in the same way they were prepared two millennia ago in Jerusalem. Each sacrifice is carefully placed on large honed skewers in order not to break any of the animal's bones, a regulation stipulated in the Torah. The priest gives the signal and the lambs are plunged into the fiery pits. A metal grate is placed on top to hold the skewers in position. In order to prevent the meat from turning to gristle, wet blankets are thrown over the top to smother the fire. Thick, wet mud is placed on top, cutting off the oxygen supply and sealing in the juices of the lamb. In Jesus' day, the great temple was the only place where all the paschal sacrifices were held. Before entering the temple grounds, every person would have to purify themselves in a ritual bath called a mikveh. A forerunner to baptism, this symbolic washing was considered to spiritually cleanse the individual. More than 70 ritual baths have been uncovered next to the southern wall of the old city. After the water immersion, 
These steps were climbed, leading through the arches and onto holy ground. The blast from the trumpets of the Temple Mount announced the opening of the great holiday. Making their way together toward the upper room, the disciples sensed the evening awaiting them would somehow be different, but they didn't know why. Jesus, though, knew what his fate was to be. He tried in the past explaining to the disciples, his friends, but to no avail. Jesus would have to play out his destiny alone. The aroma from the food filled the air. Both the upper room and the meal of freedom awaited the 13 expectant guests. In Jesus' day, a person's status was measured by where he was seated at the table. Before the Seder began, there seemed to be a dispute amongst the disciples. They probably argued that the closer one sat to Jesus, the greater he was in the eyes of the Master. We can assume that John and Peter expected to sit next to Jesus as they were personally asked by him to prepare the Passover. John, a gentle individual and a brilliant thinker, as his gospel clearly demonstrates, obtained one of the expected seats of honor next to the Master. But the other seat next to Jesus seemingly went to the only Judean of the group, Judas Iscariot. Simon Peter was deeply hurt. The disciples were a group of 12 very different individuals who stayed together for three years. Controversy and disagreements were bound to occur from time to time. It was at this juncture that Jesus was determined to teach the principle of humility. He decided to wash the feet of his disciples, a task one would normally delegate to a servant. Approaching Peter, we realize how upset Peter was. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus not only taught humility, but he did so with great compassion. He was able to make Peter understand, and in so doing, succeeded in calming the air. Throughout the ages, the Jewish people have maintained the same traditional order as they would have done in Jesus' day. The washing of hands during the Seder is followed by a benediction. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with thy commandments and enjoyed on us the cleansing of the hands. On this night, hope for man's redemption is earnestly expressed. It is believed that Elijah the prophet may enter during the Seder meal 
announcing the arrival of the Messiah. So, in addition to four cups of wine, which the Seder calls for, a special cup is set aside for him. After the wine, the cover over the matzot is lifted and a blessing follows, beginning with the words, This is the bread of affliction which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let anyone who is needy come and celebrate. Of the three matzot raised, the middle one is broken, with one part wrapped and placed aside. It is called the afikomen, and will later be shared by all the participants of the Seder. Now comes the reading of the Haggadah, which unfolds the chronicle of the children of Israel, relating from the time of the Exodus to the building of the Temple. The story is told with songs and hymns, emphasized by the tasting of bitter herbs when speaking about the bitter life in Egypt, or drinking wine when glorifying the Lord. It is believed that Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Seder on Mount Zion. A large church, the Dormition Abbey, stands right opposite the building believed to be that of the upper room. The site today attracts many visitors and pilgrims, but only few of them know that this spot is located adjacent to the tomb of King David. Though some scholars will dispute this supposition, the place has a long history. It served as a messianic synagogue during the second and third century and was later renovated by the Crusaders If this is in fact the authentic location, then looking at it, we can presume that Jesus and his disciples were seated right here. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Jesus opened with a festive holiday blessing called the Kiddush over the first cup of wine. Then Jesus passed it on to each of his disciples, beginning with John, who was seated on his right hand side. This was red wine, a reminder of the blood of the Lamb that saved the children of Israel in Egypt. As they were drinking the wine, they silently recited the blessing for thou hast lovingly granted us, O Lord our God, this day of the Feast of Matzot, the time of our freedom. Sharing the wine was followed by the blessing over the unleavened bread. Jesus raised the Matzot and praised God for bringing forth bread from the earth and for the joy of eating the matzah. Next came the bitter herbs, the second cup of wine, and the cup set aside for Elijah. And finally, the time had arrived for the delicious meal, The paschal lamb prepared by John and Peter was brought in. This was a joyful hour of eating and drinking, chatting and laughing. As they were eating, they spoke about the liberation of the children of Israel and the joy of being free. They knew that the more one tells of the departure from Egypt, the more one merits praise. On the table was the full spread of plenty. Indeed, this was a meal appealing to both eye and palate, a banquet fit for a king 
and on that night everyone felt like royalty. Yet, the mood suddenly changed. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. He said to him, You have said it yourself. He thinks he's a king. After Judas left the room, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and divide it among yourselves. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus raised the matzot, and he said to them, This is my body. That night, possessed by his destiny and greed, Judas made his way to Caiaphas. He knew that the high priest would still be awake, celebrating the Seder meal. Why have you come at this hour of the night? It has to do with Jesus. I have something to tell you.
Yes, sir. On that Passover night, the seeds of a new religion were planted. Bread and wine became fundamental components of the Christian faith. But beyond the religious implications, this powerful story intrigued the imagination of artists who were drawn to investigate their version of the hidden drama in this Passover meal. The Last Supper has now superseded the Exodus from Egypt, yet there is a direct correlation between the two events. It is the blood of the Lamb that was used to save and deliver the children of Israel. Today, Christianity and Judaism have much in common. They are both nourished from the same roots, and both the Passover and the Eucharist are linked firmly to the ancient history of the Jewish nation. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls shed some light on the origins of the Eucharist. The writers of these manuscripts who have vanished into the pages of history tell of the idea of unity and communal meals. These concepts and values of sharing communion are very similar to the ceremony of the Eucharist. Today in Jerusalem, the streets echo with chants of days gone past. Inside the walls of this timeless city exist a mosaic of cultures, religions, and images. Pilgrims continue to arrive in quest of spiritual discovery. Little remains today of the Jerusalem that Jesus knew, but once a year, that same fever of the Passover preparations fill the air. It is then that the sounds and the smells and the tastes all serve as a constant reminder of the one who had shared his last meal in the company of his loving pupils.